Chapter Sixteen, Part Three of Mounted Police Life in Canada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mounted Police Life in Canada by Captain Burton Dean. Chapter Sixteen, Part Three. Louis Riel executed for treason. Mr. Osler's cross-examination of the next witness was of absorbing interest. Dr. Francois Roy was one of the prisoner's witnesses from Quebec, whose expenses were paid by the government. He told Mr. Fitzpatrick that for more than fifteen or sixteen years he had been medically superintendent of the lunatic asylum at Beauport in Quebec, and it had been his duty to visit the principal asylums in the United States and see how the patients were treated there he had made a special study of diseases of the brain he said that the prisoner was an inmate of the asylum for about nineteen months prior to january eighteen seventy eight suffering from megalomania and passing under the name of la rochelle he was placed therein by the provincial government of quebec in reply to mr fitzpatrick the doctor said i am perfectly certain that when the prisoner was under our care he was not of sound mind but he became cured before he left more or less but from what i heard here to-day i am ready to say that i believe on these occasions his mind was unsound and that he was labouring under the disease so well described by dagonot in cross-examination mr osler elicited from the witness that he was one of two proprietors of a private asylum having an average of from eight hundred to nine hundred inmates. He said they had a medical superintendent and a treasurer. Question. The proprietors only have a general supervision? Answer. More than that, I myself am a specialist. The doctor admitted that he had brought no books or papers. Before starting, he had looked into the register to refresh his memory as to the date of La Rochelle's discharge, and for the rest said, I thought they would ask me my opinion of the case. Having satisfied his legitimate curiosity on matters in general connected with the conduct of the institution, Mr. Osler came at length to the disease and its characteristics in this wise. Question. You say the main feature of this disease is what? What is the leading feature of this disease, do you say? Do you say that it is a fixed idea, incapable of change? Answer. That is one thing I may say. Question. Will you answer the question? Do you say that the leading feature of the disease is a fixed idea incapable of a change by reason? Answer. I did not succeed in changing. Question. I ask you, is that the leading feature of the disease? Answer. That is one of the features. Question. Is it the leading feature? Answer. It is one of them. It is one of the characteristic features. Question. A fixed idea with a special ambition incapable of change by reasoning? Answer. Yes, we did not succeed in changing the idea of the patient. Question. Well, that fixed idea is beyond his control? Answer. I would not be prepared to say entirely. Question. If it is beyond his control, he is an insane man? Answer. Yes. Question. Is not this fixed idea beyond his control? Answer. Yes. Question. If within his control it is an indication of sanity? Answer. That he was trying to get better, he may have had intermissions in which he understood his condition. Question. It is subject to control. It is not a fixed idea. That is what we have agreed upon as the leading characteristic, do you understand? Answer. I do not know what you are after. Question. If this idea is subject to control, then this man is sane. Answer. There may be intermissions when he can control himself, because then the insanity disappears. Question. And then there is a lucid interval? Answer. Yes. Question. During the period of the insanity, the idea possesses the man, and it is not controllable? Answer. No. Question. Is that the leading feature of the disease? Answer. Partly. Question. Do you know of any other? Answer. I am not an expert in insanity. Question. Can you give me any other leading feature of the disease? Answer. I have no other feature to give.
question. That is the only one you can describe? Answer. I gave you the features and characteristics of the disease well enough. Question. I am going to keep you to that unless you want to enlarge upon it. I am going to build my theory upon that. You can enlarge it as much as you like now, but do not go back upon me afterwards. Is there any other leading feature of the disease? Answer. I have given you the principal characteristics of his disease. Question. I want to get the particular characteristics of this form of mania. Answer. They have intermissions, sometimes for months and sometimes for days. The least contradiction excites them. Question. There is a class of healthy intermissions. Sometimes a man likes beer and sometimes whiskey. I want to get the characteristics that distinguish him from a healthy man, not those that we have in common with the insane. Answer. We always answer reasonably, but when a man comes and pretends to know everything and talks nonsense, we suspect that, to a certain extent, he has lost his reason. Question. We want to get at the leading characteristic. You have given us one feature. Is there only the one feature? If there are any other features, say so. Answer. I won't give you any. Question. Will you stick to it? Answer. Yes. Question. Then what leading idea, not subject to change by reason, is it that you have fixed upon in the evidence yesterday and today, bringing you to the conclusion that he is of unsound mind? Answer. It is because of some symptoms. Question. Tell me the symptoms that bring you to the conclusion that this man is within the rule you have laid down. Tell me the facts that bring him within that rule. Answer. The facts are that he has always kept that characteristic. Question. Answer that question. Mr. Fitzpatrick. The witness has been speaking in English for some time past. If the witness does not understand the questions properly, he should answer the questions in French. Mr. Osler. If the man wants to hide himself under the French, he can do so. Question. You understand what I mean? Answer. Parlez-moi français? Mr. Osler. It will be for the jury to say whether he is making the change at his own suggestion or at that of the counsel on the other side. Question. Having given a rule to test this insanity, what fact is there, disclosed in the evidence, which leads you to say that the prisoner comes within the rule? Answer. That part of the evidence given by the clergy today shows in a positive manner that the prisoner has manifested symptoms that we meet with in megalomania. Question. That is no answer to my question. I want the fact on which you bring the prisoner within the rule that you have laid down. I want to take the fact proved by the evidence. Question. Tell me the fact on which you rely. Answer. The prisoner gets this theory from the idea that he has a mission. Question. Do you understand that to be the fixed idea, not controllable by reason? Answer. I believe so, because reason has never so far succeeded in changing the idea that he has. Question. Is that the only reason you have for saying that the prisoner is insane? Answer. It is, and I believe it to be sufficient. Question. Is it consistent with laboring under an idea not controllable by reason that he would abandon that idea for $35,000? Mr. Fitzpatrick. I object to that. That has not been proved. His Honor. What is the question? Mr. Osler. Is it consistent with a man having an idea not controllable by reason that he will abandon the idea for $35,000? Let that be a hypothetical question. Mr. Fitzpatrick. I object to the question. His Honor. He can put hypothetical questions. Mr. Osler. My learned friend must know that the question is regular and should not interfere at a critical part of the examination so as to give the witness a cue. Mr. Fitzpatrick. I did not have any such intention. We have the right to object and intend to exercise that right. Mr. Osler. You should not exercise it in such a way as to give the witness a cue. That is the second cue that you have given the witness. You gave him a cue in regard to speaking French. It would be unprofitable to follow Dr. Roy's evidence any further. He was hopelessly out of his depth, and his counsel had to do something desperate to save his face. 
when in order to evade answering a question he told mr osler that he was not an expert in insanity a good many people who heard him wondered what he was doing there at all mr osler finally dismissed him with a gesture of great contempt and in these words well doctor if you will not answer the question in french or in english i may as well let you go you can go he then turned his broad back upon him and the doctor stepped blithely out of the box as if he were a hero father vital formond was another of the prisoner's witnesses brought from prince albert at the expense of the crown it was he who consulted the other reverend fathers as to whether riel should be allowed to continue in his religious duties he told mr lemieux that riel had extraordinary ideas on the subject of the trinity the only god was god the father and god the son was not god the holy ghost was not god either the second person of the trinity was not god and as a consequence of this the virgin mary was not the mother of god but the mother of the son of god instead of saying hail mary mother of god he said hail mary mother of the son of god he did not admit the doctrines of the church of the divine presence as to his political ideas he wanted first to go to winnipeg and lower canada and the united states and even france he said he will take your country even and then he was to go to italy and overthrow the pope and then he would choose another pope of his own making mr lemieux have you made up your mind about the prisoner being insane as far as religious matters are concerned father f we were much embarrassed at first because sometimes he looked reasonable and sometimes he looked as a man who did not know what he was saying mr lemieux finally father f we made up our minds that there was no way to explain his conduct but that he was insane otherwise he would have been too big a criminal father fourmont gave this evidence on july thirtieth as a witness for the defence he was somewhat less guarded on august seventh following when he made an affidavit appealing for mercy on behalf of Philip Carnot, Maxime Lafime, Moise Oilet, Pierre Parentineau, Emmanuel Champagne, and Philip Carnot, all of whom I firmly believe, so the affidavit runs, were kept in the rebel camp through terror of their own lives and for fear of their families being punished should they attempt to escape. The following extracts from the same affidavit to impress the people and keep them within his power this man riel reverted to all kinds of trickery often have i seen him praying aloud prostrating himself in prayer and ordering all the others to do so then he made a deep impression on his poor ignorant dupes and so convinced them of his divine mission that it was impossible to convince them that he was a trickster and would lead them to destruction riel so played on their ignorance that he made them believe in his power to work miracles they firmly believed this i heard them say that riel could make it thunder and could cure disease without medicines riel himself declared that he was once the victim of an incurable disease of the heart but that on may twenty fourth he had cured the disease by his divine power he also declared that if he should be killed it did not matter he would be with them again alive and that would prove to them his divine mission he cried it is the holy ghost that speaks who shall dare disbelieve me oh my poor people i could not restrain them they were under the infatuation of this arch traitor and trickster till he got them committed by the effusion of blood i heard him say and proclaim death 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 to any one who tries to desert and many of the poor people had guns pointed at their hearts by Riel's orders, because he suspected them of wishing to get away, and to complete his terrorism over the poor people, he declared it to be his determination to put me, this deponent, in the front of the battle. This affidavit, of which I have quoted a very small part, is interesting as showing that a week's further reflection was sufficient to bring the Reverend Father to the conclusion that, after all, criminality and not insanity was the preponderating weight in the scale the insanity plea was ridiculous from the first what did a couple of partisan doctors hurriedly imported from the east after one or two brief interviews know about the prisoner and the state of his mind compared with us 
who were in daily communication with him. It was no uncommon thing for us to have lunatics in our charge, and very skilful and sympathetic treatment they used to receive at the hands of Dr. Jukes, the senior surgeon of the force. He was in daily communication with Louis Riel in the discharge of his duties, and never had any reason to suspect him of insanity. Nor had I, nor had Sergeant Pichot, the provost in charge of the prison, and we had had the prisoner in custody for over two months. I was asked at the trial if I had ever seen anything to indicate that the prisoner was not of sound mind, and I replied, Nothing whatever. Question. Anything to indicate the contrary? Answer. Yes, I think so. He always gave me the impression of being very shrewd. As I left the witness box to return to my place in court, I had to pass the dock, and as I did so, Riel said to me, Thank you, Captain, and he meant it. He particularly resented the imputation of insanity, and did not seem to realize that it was the one hope of saving his life. I have no doubt in my own mind that if Father Fourmont had laid an information before a justice of the peace that Louis Riel was insane and dangerous to be at large, and had abduced in corroboration of his complaint some of the evidence which he embodied in his affidavit before mentioned, the accused man would have been committed to one of our grand rooms for temporary detention, pending inquiry and observation. This was not done, and as Father Fourmond and his confreres held their peace, the outside world knew nothing of the prisoner's eccentricities as alleged. If the matter had been brought to the notice of the mounted police, they would have been glad of an opportunity to remove this firebrand, and would have attended to it, but in truth insanity was never mentioned in connection with Riel's name until his counsel originated the idea at the trial. Mr. Fitzpatrick made a long and very able address on behalf of his client, and at the close thereof the prisoner was informed by the court that if he had any remarks to make to the jury, then was the time to speak. This is a special privilege accorded by statute to a person charged with high treason, and before Riel opened his mouth, Mr. Lemieux told the court that his counsel must not be considered responsible for any declaration he might make. Riel made a long, rambling speech, from which it is not an easy matter to make extracts. The following is, however, material to the question of sanity or otherwise. Today, when I saw the glorious General Middleton bearing testimony that he thought I was not insane, and when Captain Dean proved that I am not insane, I felt that God was blessing me and blotting away from my name, the blot resting upon my reputation on account of having been in the lunatic asylum of my good friend Dr. Roy. I have been in an asylum, but I thank the lawyers for the crown who destroy the testimony of my good friend Dr. Roy, because I have always believed that I was put in the asylum without good reason. Even if I was going to be sentenced by you gentlemen of the jury, I have this satisfaction if I die, that if I die I will not be reputed by all men as insane as a lunatic. A good deal has been said by the two reverend fathers, André and Fourmond. I cannot call them my friends, but they made no false testimony. I know that a long time ago they believed me more or less insane. As to religion, what is my belief? What is my insanity about that? My insanity, Your Honour, gentlemen of the jury, is that I wish to leave Rome aside, inasmuch as it is the cause of division between Catholics and Protestants. The nineteenth century is to be treated in certain ways, and it is probably for that reason I have found the word exovied. I prefer to be called one of the flock. I am no more than you are. I am simply one of the flock, equal to the rest. If it is any satisfaction to the doctors to know what kind of insanity I have, if they are going to call my pretensions insanity, I say humbly, through the grace of God, I believe I am the prophet of the new world. Mr. Robinson closed the case for the crown in a magnificent speech, and freely castigated the counsel of the other side who preceded him. I should explain here that we had in the barracks at that time some fifty half-breeds and Indian prisoners, including Poundmaker, the Indian chief, and these men were all awaiting trial for treason felony. Mr. Robinson said, among other things, 
It will not be necessary to go over the evidence in detail, for a reason we seldom find in cases of this kind. There is no contradiction, there is no dispute, there is not a single witness whose word has been doubted, there is not a single fact proved on the part of the Crown which anybody has been called to contradict, and it stands, therefore, as an admission, and an admission made by counsel for the defence, that the case, as presented, has been made out beyond all question. What my learned friends' addresses amount to was practically this. They told you, in fact, that this rebellion was justifiable. My learned friend, Mr. Greenshields, told you that the men responsible for the blood that was shed were the people who had refused the petitions which the half-breeds made under the direction and guidance of the prisoner at the bar. In the next breath he told you that this rebellion was directed and carried on by an irresponsible lunatic. My learned friends must make their choice between their defences. They cannot claim for their client what is called a niche in the temple of fame, and at the same time assert that he is entitled to a place in a lunatic asylum. What, in reality, is the defence which you, as sensible men, are fixed to find by your verdict? You are asked to find that six or seven hundred men may get up an armed rebellion, with its consequent loss of life, its loss of property, that murder and arson and pillage may be committed by that band of armed men, and we are to be told that they are all irresponsible lunatics. It is my duty to put these facts to you plainly and strongly, because it is our duty to protect society. And all that I can say is that, if such folly as finding this man insane is possible in this country, you say in effect to men who desire to come here to live that there is no sufficient protection by law for either life, property, or liberty. Are you prepared to say that? Because that is the single issue placed before you by the counsel for the Crown. Disguise it as you like, speak of it as you like, that is the simple result and the plain consequence. My learned friend, Mr. Fitzpatrick, must have forgotten what is due to a prisoner when he charged those who were acting for the crown with some warmth for not having called poundmaker to prove the receipt of that document note that is the letter signed by riel found in poundmaker's camp he was good enough at the same time to say that those who were conducting the case for the crown were persons who understood fair play it was because we did understand fair play because it would have been improper to have called poundmaker to swear to that that we did not call him. If we had attempted to put Poundmaker in the box to prove the receipt of this document, we would have been asking Poundmaker to declare on oath his own complicity in this rebellion, and Poundmaker would have said to us, I decline to answer your questions, and any judge would have said to those who acted for the Crown, Gentlemen, you had no business to put a man in that position. Now that it is our answer on the part of the Crown to the charge that we did not call the prisoners to prove their own guilt out of their own mouths, those who are guilty of this rebellion, and those who have not a proper excuse, have taken the step upon their own heads, and they must suffer the punishment which the law from all time, and which the law for the last five centuries, has declared to be punishment of the crime of treason. The case was left to the jury in a very full charge, and the law, as regards the defence of insanity, clearly stated in a manner to which no exception was taken, either at the trial or in the court of Queen's Bench of Manitoba, or before the Privy Council. The jury brought in a verdict of guilty, with a recommendation to mercy, and were discharged. The prisoner was asked if he had anything to say, why sentence should not be pronounced upon him, and made a very long, rambling speech, after which he was sentenced to be executed at Regina on September 18th. An appeal was taken to the Court of Appeal in Manitoba, and also to the Privy Council, but the judgment was affirmed by both courts. Riel, after his sentence, was not long in attending to his spiritual affairs, and was then received once more into the bosom of the Church. Before this could be done, however, he had to recant his errors, which he did in a long manuscript document, dated the fourth day of August, and of which a translation is as follows. Renunciation made by Mr. Louis Riel, whose name is also David Riel, of all his errors in the presence of the Reverend Father Fourmont, Oblate of Mary Immaculate, his father confessor, the fourth day of August, 1885. I, the undersigned, Louis Riel, 
being in full possession of my faculties and of my free will, without any other motive than to ensure my eternal salvation, in reconciling myself with the God whom I have offended, and to amend the scandals which I have been so unhappy as to cause, do solemnly abjure all the errors which I have believed, professed, and taught contrary to the doctrine of the Holy Apostolic and Roman Church, beseeching her, in the person of her charitable ministers, to bestow upon me her holy absolution for all my crimes and iniquities, as I renounce my false mission of profit, the prime cause of my errors, and of all other backslidings. I particularly abjure my sins against the most holy and adorable Trinity, against the divine motherhood of the August, and immaculate mother of God, against the most holy and adorable Eucharist, against the eternal punishment of hell, against the infallibility of the holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome, and of her visible head, the Holy Father the Pope, against the authority and integrity of divine inspiration of the holy scriptures, and of the Catholic tradition, against the apostolic institution of the Sabbath day. I believe with all my heart and with my mouth freely and fervently confess that there is one God in three persons, consubstantial and perfectly equal in all things, that is to say, that the Father is God, the Son is God, like unto the Father, begotten by Him from all eternity, consubstantial with His Almighty Father, eternal, infinitely perfect like unto Himself, who, when He, the Divine Son of God, abased himself so as to make himself like unto us except as to sin took our likeness upon him in the womb of the blessed and immaculate virgin mary ever a virgin by the operation of the holy spirit and consequently mother of the person who is god mother of god according to the catholic faith solemnly confirmed at the ecumenical council of ephesus i believe therefore that there are two natures in jesus christ our lord the divine nature and the human nature, although he can only be one person, the person of the Son of God. He is perfect God and perfect man, so that when he says that his Father is greater than himself, it is not the teaching of the holy Catholic Church that he is not holy man and holy God. I further believe that the Holy Ghost, the third person of the most holy and adorable Trinity, is God, like unto God the Father and the Son, proceeding from the Father and the Son, being one God with the Father and the Son. I believe in the seven sacraments of the Holy Church, and more particularly that an ordained priest only can hear the confession of Christians and give them holy absolution, that the Blessed Eucharist is a sacrament instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ in His abundant love for us, and that it contains in verity and truth His body, blood, soul, and divinity under the holy species of bread and wine, living in that adorable sacrament not only for this mortal and temporal life, but more for the glorious and eternal life, enjoying in his body and in his Holy Spirit all the priceless treasures of his triumphant resurrection. I believe in the infallibility of the Church and of our Holy Father the Pope, speaking ex cathedra and as the lawful successor of St. Peter in his supremacy over all other bishops, of whom he is the one visible head on earth, as well as in his authority and jurisdiction over all priests and the faithful, believing that to him, as to Peter, it was said, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. I believe in the eternity of the pains of hell, that they will forever endure and never cease. Purgatory alone, having temporal punishment, proportioned to trespasses against divine justice. I believe that the Holy Sabbath day is at least an apostolic institution designed to replace the Sabbath of the ancient law, and that, consequently, the divine obligation to keep it holy is as binding upon us as was the obligation with regards to the ancient Jewish Sabbath, abolished by the new dispensation. Most humbly I solicit pardon from the public at large, particularly from the venerable representatives of the Holy Catholic Church, from the representatives of the civil power, and all my Christian brethren, for the scandalous offences which I have committed against God and his ordinances, commending myself to the pity of all men, and particularly so to that of the Almighty God, whom I have set at naught. Signed, Louis Riel, or Louis David Riel. Witness, V. Formand, O.M.I. Witness, 
L. Kuchin, O. M. I. Riel asked to see me one day, and handed me the document of which the foregoing purports to be a translation. So far as I recollect now, a recantation in the foregoing form had been presented to him by the priest for acceptance and signature, and he stipulated that he should be allowed to make a copy of it. This copy he then entrusted to me, asking me to keep it. Why, I do not know. He did not ask me to publish it, or I would not have received it, for it was not a time in the country's history when it would have been advisable to add fuel to the fire. Having explained what the foregoing document was, he then handed me another paper, which was to be signed in my presence by the two priests, Father Fourmond and Kuchin, and was witnessed by myself. This document also was to remain in my custody. A translation of it reads as follows. We, the undersigned, certify as witnesses the authenticity of the answers made by Louis David Riel, and of his recantation, and of the authenticity of the document of his renunciation, and we declare ourselves responsible before God and man for the legitimacy of the questions which we have put to him, and for the legitimacy of the recantation which we have required from him as ordained priests. Regina Prison, 7th August, 1885. S. D. V. Formand, O. M. I. S. D. L. Kuchin, O. M. I. Witness. R. Burton Dean, Superintendent, Northwest Mounted Police. He made a great point of my witnessing this document, and I did so, although I did not want to be involved in any matter which might give possible offence to the priests. Similarly, I did not want to give offence to a moribund man, and accepted both papers from him accordingly. After a lapse of thirty years, I presume there is no harm in publishing historical documents. I never discussed religious subjects with Riel. The only occasion on which he ventured to obtrude his pretensions on me was November 14th, 1885, two days before his execution, and long after the recantation of his errors, when he sent me a note by the orderly officer, written by himself, which purports to be, The narration of a vision as seen this evening, 14th November, 1885, by Luis David Riel. Prophet of the New World, care of Mr. the Inspector Dowling. On the other side of a half-page of foolscap was written, Captain R. B. Dean, a little before half-past eight o'clock this evening, as I knelt down to make the way of the cross, my eyes being shut, while I was beginning to pray and being turned towards the west, I saw before me, at a distance of about twenty or twenty-five yards, a man, dark complexion, black moustache, it struck me that it was the honourable hector langevin while i was considering his face his features changed and reminded me sick the decomposed features of the late sir george e carchet and he disappeared an instant after my mind was in doubt whether those features were not those of the honourable minister of militia the before-mentioned appeals to the manitoba court and the privy council had necessitated the postponement of the execution and it was not until November 15th that the Commissioner of Dominion Police brought the death warrant from Ottawa. We had known, of course, that it was on the way, and arrangements had been made for the morning of November 16th at eight o'clock. Riel was informed by Sheriff Chapleau of the arrival of the warrant at about 9 p.m. on the 15th, and said in reply, I am glad that at last I am to be released from suffering. The strain upon him during the previous three months had been tremendous, and he had become constitutionally weaker, although his mental condition was unchanged. He was attended at the last by fathers Andre and McWilliams, and died with the courage of a man and a Christian, and it was not possible to doubt his sanity. He had asked that his body should be given to his friends to be laid at rest in St. Boniface, the French cemetery across the Red River from Manitoba, and we handed it over to a Mr. Bonneau upon an order from the Lieutenant Governor for conveyance thither. While the coffin was thus awaiting transfer to Mr. Bonneau, it was kept in a corner of the prison yard, and while there, report was made to me that a rumour was in circulation that after the dead man had been cut down from the scaffold, a brutal mounted policeman had to the accompaniment of a blasphemous oath, 
stamped his booted foot into the dead man's face as it lay on the ground. It seems now, as I write these words, after the lapse of more than a quarter of a century, that it is almost incredible that such an improbable, senseless story should have obtained currency. But it is to be borne in mind that race prejudices and passions were running high, that the neighborhood was seething with excitement, and that it was impossible to allow the body to pass out of our possession until the falsity of this report had been demonstrated beyond all question. Colonels Irvine and MacLeod were both in barracks, as were Superintendent Gagnon and Dr. Jukes, and I took them all across to the prison yard and had the coffin opened. Gagnon was a native of Quebec, so it was very fortunate that he was able to be there. As was expected, there was no trace of any disfigurement of any kind. A few locks of hair had been taken from the brow, but this had not been done by any unsympathetic hand and the lie that had found its way into circulation was killed in its infancy. If this had not been done, we should never have heard the end of it. I will close the story of Louis Riel, so far as his life came into conjunction with mine, by reproducing a poem which he handed to me on July 13th, 1885, and which I believe was his own composition. Jésus, Marie, Joseph, sauvez-nous, intercédez pour nous. Priez pour nous. Béni soit Dieu qui glorifie le règne de Victoria. C'est en Dieu que je me confie, puisque c'est lui qui me créa. Dieu veuille que la reine voie l'éclat des plus beaux cheveux blancs, et qu'elle avance dans la joie du plus gracieux de ses ans. Fasse Jésus-Christ qu'elle atteigne ce grand âge qui n'est pas vieux, où la grâce des années règne plus en remontrant vers les cieux. Plaise à Jésus-Christ qu'elle vive pour le moins encore vingt ans, que sa majesté soit active, en bonne santé, tout le temps. Qu'elle aime, mais sans préférence, le peuple canadien français. Que toute la nouvelle France trouve auprès d'elle un libre accès. Sous son admirable couronne, sous son règne majestueux, puissante race anglo-saxonne, rendez les Irlandais heureux. Que Jésus, le Fils de Dieu même, fasse étinceler sur les mers et les terres le diadème de la reine dans l'univers. Au bureau du commissionnaire à Regina, 12 juillet 1885, dédié à Monsieur le capitaine R. B. Dean. Complimentary for my being allowed to write in the commissioner's office. End of chapter 16, part 3.